Hello, everybody. Um, this is a wonderful turnout. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Wolfram Dressler. Um, some of you know me already. Um, it's great to see some old friends um, and some new uh, faces in the crowd. Um, I currently work at the University of Melbourne. Um, I'm a research fellow there. Um, and I've been doing research in the Philippines for uh, on Palawan for, for quite some time, uh, a decade and a half, my God, time flies. Um, yeah, and we're here to, to give you kind of a, a topical overview of the state of Kainan in different parts of Southeast Asia, and that is uh, designed to give a bit of flavor to this study that we're doing. Um, it's a regional uh, overview of changes in Sweden Longfellow um, and how that impacts on uh, livelihood dynamics and ecosystem services in different parts of insular and mainland Southeast Asia. So with me um, is a wonderful group of highly esteemed scholars. Um, there's Ole Merz from the University of Copenhagen. There's uh, Professor uh, Rob Cram, a distinguished Sweden scholar who has worked in various parts of Southeast Asia for some time. Professor Keenan from the University of Melbourne, uh, a distinguished forester with a long history of working in Papua New Guinea. Philip uh, Beckbrun, um, a, uh, <coughs> a soil scientist from the University of Copenhagen. <laughs> distinguished soil scientist. <laughs> and uh, yes, uh, and uh, Dr. Soon to be Dr. <laughs> David Wilson. Uh, he's, he's a senior associate at uh, ICRAF. He's working with uh, Professor Roda Lasco. Uh, Professor Lasco, of course, is also <clears throat> on this team, but uh, was not able to make it. Um, and last, but definitely not least, uh, Ms. Jessica Clendenning from the Center for International Forestry Research, um, who has been helping us through the whole study. Um, you know, behind the scenes, logistics um, and management-wise, and choose from the institute from C4, which has funded this project. So what I'll do today um, is to quickly give you an overview of um, changes in Longfellow Swinton, um, shifting agriculture, impacts on livelihoods and ecosystem services, kind of from a broad kind of contextual overview to kind of give some flavor, some broad flavor to the more focused uh, presentations that will come after after me and they will be more on a country by country basis so so as I said um, what I will do is give you an overview of what this, of what Sweden uh, is often characterized to be uh, the value of, of long fallow um, and some of the livelihood linkages um, in terms of kind of dominant definitions of Sweden agriculture um, and yeah, how it supports the livelihoods of the rural poor in predominantly upland areas. Um, I will be focusing on a few examples from uh, the Philippines and Palawan specifically, then shift to uh, looking at how national governments uh, in the Philippines in the past, at least, um, and other countries in, in Southeast Asia have characterized and represented Sweden you know, in terms of uh, you know what it is, what it could be, um, or why it shouldn't be around, the different types of interventions, and then how the, the debate about uh, shifting agriculture or Sweden kind of uh, sits within global policy discourse and um, prominent interventions today within the context of land sharing uh, and land sparing. This <laughs> should be sparing and sharing, so anyways. Typo, yeah? Um, and then looking at some of the outcomes uh, with a more regionally uh, specific, uh, country specific focus. Moving along. So, um, Professor Cram and colleagues um, have come, we worked uh, just maybe a few years ago on coming to terms of what, of what Sweden or shipping agriculture actually is. And there's many definitions, but one that we like to draw on. Um, amounts to the intermittent clearing of forest for staple food crop production, um, which is, of course, often mixed with cash crop production, followed by a much longer period of forest fallow, right? So after cultivation, 
the, the, the forest is left to regenerate over a certain, certain period of time, um, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. And the longer the forest is left to regenerate, the more uh, fertility the, the, the forest offers the soil through biomass circulation, so on and so forth, after which a farmer may come back, clear the forest again, and then plant crops in hopefully fertile, fertile soils. Now, Swinton um, is often characterized by practitioners and academics um, in, in a certain way. And this is often a, a dominant way of, uh, or yeah, a predominant way of characterizing the essential components of uh, Swinton agriculture. It is often extensive agriculture, right, which means that a larger area of land is used um, for a, uh, you know, often what is considered to be a low to, to moderate yield. Um, the farmers who engage in extensive agriculture, uh, Swinton agriculture, are often considered to be capital poor. Um, they don't have many uh, assets. Uh, many upland Swinton agriculturalists don't own a carabao. Their main implement might be a bolo, right, or a bolok. Um, often the Swinton system um, is part of family dynamics, so family social relations, um, family decision making um, is often very much part and parcel of the process by which Sweden um, unfolds. There's often reciprocal labor exchange, which is a fancy term for sharing labor, um, and often the land upon which Sweden sits is not, you know, owned in a formal private sense. You know, often Sweden farmers don't have private title. Usually it's family tenure um, that's defined by occupancy, how long a family stays on the land, um, and the way that they use it, right, which is often referred to as uh, use of fruit. Um, <clears throat> now there's a, a lot of debate about the efficiency and the effectiveness of Sweden agriculture for the livelihoods of the poor. Um, but often what anthropologists and, and agricultural economists and others suggest is that Sweden, because it's actually low capital, it doesn't require a lot of you know, capital investments, a lot of uh, finances, um, that it's actually you know, a low cost um, and an efficient and effective way for uh, poor families to generate subsistence. Right? So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a way of farming that is well suited for uh, poor upland families. Right? They don't have a lot of savings, they don't have private title or collateral to get bank loans, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and traditionally, in the past, and in some cases uh, today, still in frontier areas like southern Palawan, any Sweden agriculturalists, um, they have what is often called long fallow systems. And these are uh, Areas uh, where Sweden was cleared, the forest was allowed to regenerate for a certain amount of time, often uh, characterized uh, after uh, long fallow being characterized after um, you know ten years, and that particular forest system um, that is often considered to be secondary growth um, has a, a range of non tuber forest products in it, um, which uh, and sometimes root crops. So on and so forth that allows a Sweden farmer to diversify his or her um, livelihood. Right? So it serves as a safety net um, across a range of, of different resources. Um, and in cases where there's low population density and there's an abundance of land, um, that kind of optimal scenario um, is, is, uh, often, is often found. And a few examples of a diversified Sweden landscape in southern Palawan. Um, you know, it gives you an idea of, of the various resources that are taken from a long fallow system. In the upper left-hand corner, you see a Tagbanwa family uh, collecting polot, uh, honey. Um, in the bottom, uh, bottom right-hand corner, you see a case of uh, diversified root crop production in a burnt-out stump. Um, it's considered to be uh, fertile because of the ash deposits, so on and so forth, yeah. And <clears throat> traditionally, in the 1960s, Anthropologists, um, especially Harold Conklin, he's considered to be a Renaissance man of Sweden. Um, 
he came up with uh, a way of characterizing uh, squid in agriculture um, that tended to kind of re-characterize Sweden in a, in a positive light, kind of like by breaking down dominant assumptions of what Sweden is and isn't. And he came up with this idea that Sweden might be broken down into an integral uh, Sweden um, and kind of partial incipient Sweden systems. An integral Sweden essentially means that Sweden agriculture is part of the, the livelihoods and life ways and culture of uh, farmers, right? It's kind of part and parcel of their way of life. And integral Sweden is often be considered to be more sustainable um, and uh, slightly more uh, culturally refined um, practice, uh, which has a you know, high degree of agroecological diversity. Um, now, the opposite of that is partial incipient Sweden, which is often considered to be done by migrant uh, farmers, um, and it is done in a way that is less integrated into the ultra and world view. It's more economically focused. You may have migrants going from the lowlands to the uplands to clear uh, forests for Sweden, and then having that plot being converted into you know, some type of plantation, right? So it's not necessarily culturally embedded um, and you know, front and center in, in the livelihood system. It's just a way of moving into an area and clearing land. And often, kind of integral incipient Swedens are considered to have short fallow, right? So Conklin began to problematize dominant assumptions about Sweden agriculture you know, by breaking down practice um, and looking at Sweden in, a, in its very uh, ways to highlight you know, positive examples of Sweden and often not so positive examples, less sustainable examples. Um, and that work that he and other anthropologists did um, was designed to kind of break down dominant assumptions and dominant discourses of Sweden that were part of law and policy, right? And the, traditionally, Sweden was often characterized as something that was uh, done only by poor indigenous farmers, um, that it was uh, you know, either uh, something that was done in remote areas, um, that was very uh, like a highly destructive practice. Um, and with the work of Conklin, there was an alternative spin uh, put on it, which highlighted the various um, positive attributes, that it was socio and culturally um, embedded, sustainable, and so on and so forth. And so at the moment, um, unfortunately, the dominant interpretation of Sweden is still um, one that is negative and criminal, um, and it's often part of national policy and discourse throughout mainland Southeast Asia. Um, what we see today, globally, uh, uh, globally, and in particular in Southeast Asia, is that um, Sweden farmers, uh, the populations are growing. Um, the status, the income status of Sweden agriculturalists is changing. Um, the populations are mixing, right? And so there's this major shift from the ways in which we once talked about and understood shifting agriculture to what it has become today, right? And it is this systematic review um, that is examining the various states of Sweden agriculture, you know, how, in what areas of Sweden, uh, in what areas of Southeast Asia does Sweden Longfellow exist? What is the practice moving to? Is the practice sustainable? Um, and is it the new, um, are the, 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 the changing land uses um, supporting the livelihoods of the rural poor um, as Sweden might have done um, and if and in what ways is, is the support unfolding today is it positive and or negative and the subsequent presentations um, by the various scholars on my on my right here will address the specific state of Sweden in certain parts of, of mainland and uh, insular Southeast Asia with specific reference to uh, kind of the on the ground conditions um, and some of the, the policies um, that, are, that are dominant today and that I couldn't get to because of a, a lack of time. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll pass the torch to the next uh, Oh yes, that's right. So we have a question to ask. Um, the first uh, is, well, the, the question is for you to think about. The first is, um, 
what's good and bad about shifting agriculture, um, and will shifting agriculture be part of your landscape in the Philippines? Now, if you can remember those questions um, and think about them over the course of the next couple of presentations, yeah, and then at the end, um, use that to inform some of the questions that you have for us and to post uh, your answers on the, the vanilla paper on the back. Um, and before we move on to the next presentation, spend maybe two or three minutes discussing with your neighbor a potential answer to those questions. That's our attempt to make this a bit more uh, participatory. So if you can take maybe two or three minutes to develop potential answers to what is good and bad about shifting cultivation today, you know, you can bring out your biases about the practice, and by extension, will Sweden be in the Philippine landscape in the next, let's say, decade or so, or longer, right? And then hang on to your thoughts. We'll talk about it later. What is good and what is bad? And it will be part of, will it be part of the landscape. There was already a big post in the note that says no. So let's think about it some more after listening to our speakers. Our next speaker is going to talk about the global overview of changes in Sweden agriculture from University of Copenhagen, Dr. Ole Metz. very much. Sorry that we didn't give you so much time to discuss, but uh, I hope you can, you can have a chance to discuss it in between, in between the presentations. But uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And I think Wolfram already presented me, but I can add that I'm, a, I'm an agronomist who, uh, who turned into a geographer. Um, and I work at uh, Geography at the University of Copenhagen. I've worked in quite many countries in Southeast Asia, unfortunately, never in the Philippines. This is my first visit. Uh, and I had my first experiences with shifting cultivation or certain agriculture in Borneo, very much in the footsteps of uh, Rob Grant, who, where I worked in some of the same areas where he was. So, what I would like to present to you today is uh, taking a little bit uh, a step back and also looking more globally. Because some years ago, with a group of uh, colleagues, we were interested in trying to find out if this rapid decline in uh, species cultivation that you see in Southeast Asia, is that also happening in uh, other places uh, in, in the tropics. So we did, uh, you could call it a kind of precursor to the systematic review that we are working on now. Uh, we did that uh, on a global level and uh, with a bit more uh, narrow focus in terms of where we got papers and so on. Um, and that spurred the interest in having this more detailed uh, review of Southeast Asia that we are working on now. So basically what we did, uh, uh, we, we got, we found 157 case studies globally that were published in this decade, in the last decade, 2000, 2010, and that looked at some sort of change in Sweden systems. Here you can, on this map you can see uh, the red dots show a decrease, uh, oh sorry, uh, the red dots show a decrease in Sweden, uh, the black ones an increase and the blue ones are no change. So this is of course exactly what the different case studies said. It's not our opinion, it's what we got from the studies. You can see in Southeast Asia it's mostly red, so there's generally a decrease in Sweden. Not really the case in Africa and, and in South America, where it's a much more mixed uh, picture. So we, we try to analyze these cases a bit more in depth. Uh, first of all, looking at what are the drivers of, of this decline. And if you look at the cases in 
in Southeast Asia. Again, you will see for Laos, for example, there were a lot of different studies. That's uh, for some reason one of the countries that has been studied most. And almost all of the drivers of change there uh, are related to some sort of policy. Uh, you also have the Philippines uh, represented with some cases, and here there's a bit more of a mixed bag of drivers of change. Also includes policy, uh, but also uh, such as population growth and uh, various environmental drivers uh, of change and economic uh, structures such as uh, access to credit and so on. So there, the different places, at least based on the case studies, differ quite a lot from a wide range of, range of drivers to more narrow ranges of drivers. But of course, it also depends on what do these studies actually look at and what do they focus on. Then we looked at, so what is actually going on? What are the changes? Uh, what is Sweden turning into? Uh, and, and you can see there, if we go back to, the, to Southeast Asia, in Laos, it's uh, use the same examples, it, it's quite diverse, uh, but a lot of it is going into annual crops. Uh, some are just turning to only doing paddy rice, and some are, are doing uh, monoculture tree crops in those cases. If you look at the Philippines, it's a bit the same, but a, a, a quite a, a different distribution. Um, and if you look at a place like Bangladesh, where we didn't have that many cases, but some, and there it was very much going into annual crops, whereas uh, with Malaysia, there is a much stronger focus on monoculture uh, tree crops. So these are some of the transitions that have been happening uh, that we found for, for Southeast Asia. And if you look at some of the other continents, you can see that uh, they seem to be more uh, unique drivers in different places, but also there's a lot less cases to, to draw on. <clears throat> then we went into looking at, okay, so we know what's happening, we know we can see some of the drivers of these changes, and then it would of course be interesting to know what are the outcomes, what comes out of uh, when Sweden changes into rubber plantations or oil farm plantations or whatever it, it goes into. And then we try, what you see on this graph is basically down here the counting of the number of case studies that we found that describe some sort of impact. Uh, and whether the impact is negative or positive was sometimes indicated, but sometimes not. So some of it is a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's our assessment. The first one is probably the most complicated one because higher labor, labor demand is that, well, it was perceived as negative in many of the studies, but it could also be positive in that it creates more uh, opportunity for work in private. Otherwise, what is, comes out quite clear from this one is that the Sweden transition increases income. Whether it's from, these are the different uh, types of transitions. So you have the, the yellow one here is uh, managed fallows. This is mixed fruit trees. This one is uh, annual crops. And uh, the monoculture plantations is here, which is a bit smaller on this side. There are also some studies that found negative impacts on income. There was an overweight of studies when looking at access to land, food security, equity, quality issues, they found more negative impacts than, than positive. Whereas for something like social networks, not a lot of cases looked at it, but a little bit surprisingly that has an overweight of positive impacts. Conflicts often increasing, usually related to land, and uh, also cultural identity, uh, going down because, well, you're changing to something else. So, I mean, you can argue whether that's negative or positive, but the studies argued it was a negative impact. On the environmental side, we also try to see, uh, okay, what is the impact of changing Sweden into something else? And the one that comes out very clearly, of course, because that's something many, many studies have been looking at is uh, forest cover. And it might be a surprise to you that change from Sweden to something else has a negative impact on forest cover. Normally we think, okay, Sweden is clearing forest, burning forest, so it must be negative for forest cover. 
but in fact, if you have a Sweden system where you have a 10-year fallow, then 90% of the land is under forest, some sort of secondary forest or up to 10-year-old forest. Whereas when you convert it into a plantation or into annual cropping of maize or something else, mining it could also be, then it, uh, of course, you remove the forest cover and you have something else. It, it's quite rare. I think the cases where there are increases, this is where you had a change into conservation forests, where forests were protected in some way or the other, uh, where sweetens could no longer be done. So the, to stop sweetening does not necessarily mean to stop deforestation. That's one very clear message from this. The others, uh, there were fewer studies, uh, but generally you could see there was also some negative impacts very often related to the forest cover, uh, for example, biodiversity and, and, uh, and also soil fertility also decreases, but that's quite obvious because you use the land more intensively, so of course you get more mining of the soil. So these were the main conclusions on a global level. So uh, I would just like to uh, add a few more comments to, because my colleagues will be talking more about the local level in Southeast Asia. And uh, I will not go into details there, but just mention uh, a bit about the dynamics of how these changes are happening in different places. This is a study we have done recently in connection with a project that actually dealt with the red, uh, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, uh, where we tried to do these, these are sort of qualitative assessments that are backed by uh, remote sensing analysis. And, you can, and we looked at this as, as a type of regime shift. For example, in China, in the Yunnan, Sichuan, Bana, uh, in the 80s, you saw a, uh, 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 an increase of especially rubber plantation, and that really was a very drastic development that moved on up, up to now and where shifting cultivation is basically gone. In Vietnam, the same thing, a forest land allocation law here caused the yellow part here to disappear, basically in Vietnam, uh, for these case areas, of course, but it's these are general trends in, in the countries as well. In Indonesia, the oil palm expansion uh, also has led to a decline in shifting conservation, but not completely because it has very much also been an expense at the expense of forests. So it's still there. And in Laos, it's starting now, uh, and it's also it's probably decline, uh, going, going away further than uh, more than what this one indicates. So I'll just end this with uh, presentation of the geography of the case studies we've been into. These crosses are from the four studies you just saw on the previous slide and what my colleagues will, well, Wolfram already talked about Palawan a bit and uh, uh, Rob will talk about Sarawak, Tilde will talk about Laos and Rob will talk about uh, Papua New Guinea. So uh, then you are situated so the geography geography wise for the next presentation. So thank you very much. Let's now go to Sarawak <laughs> to talk on student agriculture in Sarawak, Malaysia. Dr. Rob Cram from University of Queensland. Shifting cultivators uh, going to town. 
uh, Sarawak on the northwest coast of Borneo, just a little bit south of Malawan, I guess, uh, divided into these three geographic zones, the coastal zone where the big swamps uh, predominate, uh, this uh, undulating hilly midland zone where shifting cultivation is practiced, and a very mountainous inland zone, uh, very sparsely populated. The population of Sarawak, two and a half million, with a, a growth rate that's still quite rapid, though slow, uh, but as you can see, a, a characteristic low population density uh, for landscapes where shifting cultivation dominates. And different from Malaysia as a whole, or from peninsular Malaysia, the largest ethnic group in Sarawak, uh, the Dayaks, uh, who don't necessarily refer to themselves in that uh, collective way, but include a number of groups who live in long houses and traditionally practice shifting cultivation. So it's Dayak livelihoods and farming practices that I'm focusing on. Traditionally shifting cultivation for 100 years, a smallholder cash crops, beginning with rubber, uh, buttressed and supplemented by non-farm employment. At least that was the system of livelihood that I encountered when I first uh, began to uh, work in Sarawak and study this group. Uh, the diet longhouse is, is quite a unique structure, but I, I won't dwell on it here. Just to say that it's really a village under one roof with perhaps 20 or 30 uh, autonomous households, each occupying their own family room. Uh, but sharing a common gallery in which the elective decisions and rituals and so on are undertaken. So the practice of shifting cultivation, as uh, Wolfram has described, is a rotational shifting cultivation that's been practiced for many centuries. So a longhouse exists in a territory largely comprising uh, secondary forests. And then each year a portion of that forest is selected uh, for the, the farms of the longhouse members uh, and the, the, the trees they cut down and the vegetation dried and burned. Uh, the seed of rice and other crops, particularly maize and cassava, sown into that uh, burned over field. Uh, several months of weeding in order to ensure that the, the rice crop can survive and, and yield. And then a, a harvest, uh, a low yield per hectare, perhaps one ton per hectare, but a high return to the small labour input that's required. But the, the point to emphasise again is that this is a rotational system. So uh, once a crop of rice and other crops are, are taken, uh, the forest is allowed to return over a cycle of 7, 8, 10, 12 years. Uh, before that same area of land is cultivated again. So around 1980, when uh, uh, some colleagues and I uh, attempted to map the extent of this form of shifting cultivation, uh, this is how it appeared in Sarawak. So uh, dominating particularly in the west, which was more densely populated, and uh, where I will um, demonstrate through this case study. So the context for change in that period since 1980, when shifting cultivation was uh, uh, dominant in terms of land use and livelihoods, is that Sarawak obviously is part of the rapidly growing <coughs> Malaysian economy, in which agriculture's share of the economy is, is declining and it's reached quite low percentages. And as part of that phenomenon, rural urban migration has been uh, increasing over a number of decades. Within rural areas, there's been a move to large-scale commercial agriculture, particularly oil palm. Uh, so shifting cultivation in this context has been in steep decline over the, the three or so decades since 1980. Uh, rural livelihoods uh, are based on cash crops, including oil palm, smallholder oil palm, uh, and non-farm employment. So let me illustrate that with this case study. I'm selecting one longhouse community right in the heart of that shifting cultivation zone down in western Sarawak. Uh, the name of the community is, is Bagalinka. This is the, the longhouse itself as it was in 1980 and as you can see situated in the centre of quite a vast territory of uh, mainly secondary forest. 
There were 29 households at that time, 185 residents occupying a territory, uh, clearly defined territory at 13 square kilometres, so a low population density. We depended on uh, river transport and uh, the level of the river in order to shift people and, and goods up and down to that longhouse. Swinton agriculture was their main activity through the year. So here's the, the head man of that longhouse uh, in a field of upland rice, about one hour's walk from the longhouse itself, right on the edges of their territory. And they would say rice farming is our way of life. It would be impossible for us not to undertake Swinton agriculture. It, it defines who we are. And I faithfully wrote that down and published it and said what, what good, sustainable, diversified farmers they are. Self-sufficiency in rice was a major household goal. Uh, and it defined your adequacy as a, uh, as a farmer and as a member of the community. As I mentioned, they had early success with rubber planting, going back 100 years. And this supplemented the activity of Sweden agriculture. Uh, from the mid-1970s, uh, there were several booms in pepper cultivation. And that enabled them to add a second cash crop, but still uh, supplementing or complementing their Sweden farming. So this was the, the land use in Bagalintan territory uh, in, in 1980. And you can see the different land uses identified uh, along the, the river that runs through the territory. Uh, you can see uh, reserve land, but also small pepper gardens and, uh, and rubber plantations. But most of the land is the uh, unmarked uh, secondary forest uh, with the hill rice farms, the current years, Sweden farms uh, indicated there. Times change. And, uh, so I did a restudy. I revisited this community to see what they were up to, whether my anticipations uh, were justified or not. And mostly they weren't. Mostly what I thought would be the case uh, was no longer the case. The head man still there, uh, but he would, he would not be the oldest person. In fact, he would represent about the average age of the, the residents in this longhouse. Uh, I could get there through the Trans Borneo Highway um, in just a fraction of the time it used to take. Uh, so road transport replaces river transport, with a, an interesting side effect in that the number of uh, crocodiles has increased dramatically. <laughs> And uh, you don't go down to the riverbank uh, without taking a lot of care. The demography was interesting. The number of households, the length of the longhouse had increased from 29 to 41 households. But the number of residents, those resident in the longhouse, had decreased. So the number of residents per household had half. And that's obviously reflecting the outmigration of household members and the aging the resident population. So as I say, more rooms but less people. This is the longhouse veranda and on the, uh, the right hand side you can see the doors leading to the individual family apartment. But this is a typical view of the longhouse uh, during the day. Uh, there was somebody walking across the, the back wall just before I took this photo. I waited a second until they gone. Uh, so it, it looks pretty empty and pretty quiet for much of the time. People coming back at weekends if they don't work and live too far away, but essentially uh, a very quiet longhouse. We mapped the sources of livelihood in 1980 and 2009. So the red or purple bars of the 1980 livelihoods measured as the percentage of households at that time who drew on that activity as a source of livelihood. So as you can see, hill paddy or swimming cultivation 100% of households cultivated the rice and was a major source of livelihood. Uh, in 2009, no. There was absolutely no sweet cultivation. I said, what about your statement, the rice is our way of life, we would never not cultivate. Said, well, that was before. <laughs> what about the sacred rice that you plant at the center of your field? What happened to that? Well, we ate that. <laughs> so not only had they ceased to cultivate, they had no seed, they had no skills, no of returning to Sweden cultivation. Um, 
rubber cultivation, pepper cultivation had also decreased quite markedly, but there was still uh, between 20 and 35% of households cultivating those cash crops. Uh, they were much more reliant on wages, daily and monthly wages, pensions, remittances, uh, and other sources of, of cash income. So there'd been a major shift away from agricultural and forest activities, and much greater dependence on uh, non-rural sources of income. Uh, natural capital, the land and, and forest in which they lived, had uh, declined in importance. Uh, livelihoods were no longer tied to that 30 square kilometre territory. Uh, the forested land had become idle in their own words. Yet, the ownership of that land was still uh, an important issue to them. Instead of natural capital, human capital had become more important, particularly formal education, giving them access to urban employment at higher levels, and the skills and experience obtained through migration. So without practicing shifting cultivation and only a few uh, cultivating small pots of cash crops, maybe a fish pond or some vegetables, there was a vast area of secondary forest which continued to regenerate and continued to account for the majority of the land that they owned and their customer tenure. So the question that they themselves faced was what to do with this women fellow land, this now idle land. So there were a number of things at the time of the restudy uh, that they put forward. They, they joined with uh, eight or nine surrounding communities to uh, put a proposition, a proposal to the government for a large-scale oil palm development that could be managed as, a, as an estate so that their sweet of colour could be used for oil palm. That, hadn't, that proposal was not successful. Uh, they applied and had been successful in having 100 hectares of rubber high yielding rubber developed by the Department of Agriculture planted on their land at no cost to themselves. Uh, but they had no intention of taking that rubber or utilizing it. It was too far from the longhouse. Uh, there was no labor. Uh, they were too old to tap it. So they were had negotiated with a, a contractor to come and uh, tap that rubber to exploit the resource and, and pay them rental. They didn't discuss it, but the question is there of whether that forest could be valued in, in some other way. It might be retained as a forest reserve, a store of carbon, a store of biodiversity, uh, were there options for that. To conclude in one slide, rural urban migration and the whole economic transformation in Malaysia has totally changed the longhouse economy. Uh, Sweden agriculture in this case and in many others has disappeared within a generation. Uh, any differentiation between rural households is based largely on human capital rather than land ownership. But they still regard land and forest within their traditional territory as important. Uh, they want to retain their attachment uh, to the longhouse community. Uh, in fact, they're building and have built an entirely new longhouse in order to return to it from time to time for ceremonies and on special occasions. Uh, arguably so that they still have access to this potential source of wealth and inheritance for whatever it is they decide to deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much for the inspiration. You had a 29-year interval of data from 2009 to 1980. I'm not going to wait 20 years to visit my field site in Ifuga. I probably won't be able to carry my backpack anymore. <laughs> okay, now let's listen to Carbon Dynamics of Sweden Systems, Sweden and Red Plus, by Dr. Tilde Beth Boon from the University of Copenhagen. Thank you very much. So, my name is Tilde Beckholm, and I'm a somewhat distinguished soil scientist from the University of Copenhagen. During the last 15 years, I've been working with the Sweden conservation in most countries of Southeast Asia, but not the Philippines. 
but I'm very happy to be here. So I'm going to talk about carbon dynamics of Swedish systems, Sweden and RED, um, based on some general observations, and then diving into a case study that I recently was a part of that took place in Laos. So for those of you who may not be so familiar with RED, I can reveal that RED is a, a framework that has been proposed by the United Nations, a framework under which forest-rich developing countries are supposed to receive payments for reducing carbon emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. That's the acronym of, of, the, of RED. So that could, for example, be in terms of reducing deforestation rates or by promoting land use changes from land use types that stores that store lower amounts of carbon to land use types that store more carbon. Um, and at the moment, swim systems are, are perceived as forest degradation, so they don't fall under the forest category. Which, I would argue, is somewhat problematic. Because if you look at the uh, swim system like this on the house, then it is true that in some areas of the system you have what you could call degradation, namely on the active fields, the clear fields, where conservation is taking place. But at the same time, and as an inherent feature of the same system, you will also have what you could call forest regeneration taking place as a part of the same system. So basically, it depends where you look. Um, so to make this clear, I would like to go through some schematic uh, uh, figures of carbon stocks in different kinds of systems. So first, this is a figure of, um, of the carbon storage of a primary forest, the highest possible terrestrial uh, carbon storage. This is time over here, and this is the carbon stock without any chain. So what you see here is a high carbon stock that is stable over time. Then if you move to a degraded forest, you have a somewhat lower carbon stock, but still quite stable for one time. Then if you look at a long rotation swimming chicken conservation system, it's the same. Um, then you have a temporal dynamic here as the fellow, here we have a clearance. Then the time the fellow is regrowing, building up the carbon stock in the biomass, and then here you cut and burn it, and you lose uh, your carbon stock, but it builds up again here. So it makes it somewhat more tricky to assess the, the carbon stock of the system. What you have to do is to calculate the time average carbon stock, which requires that you know the growth rates of the fellows. So in this case, I put a line here to represent what would be an estimate of the time average carbon stock. If you intensify the system to a, a short rotation system, then you get a, a higher frequency of uh, occurrence and also a lower build-up of, of the carbon here in your system. And consequently, you get a lower time uh, average carbon stock. Then again, if you move to permanent cultivation or permanent agriculture with no fallow at all, then you get a very stable and lower carbon stock. Maybe with some intra-annual fluctuation, but over the long term, stable. So this is how it looks like if you, if you compare the time average carbon stocks with this. So what I want, my argument here is that if you look here, down here, there is some room for carbon for mitigation here within the, the swimming system. Namely, if you reverse the patterns of intensification and move from a permanent uh, cropping system to a system that follows, and if you increase the follow periods, you will also increase the carbon uh, storage system. Okay, so that's very nice. However, as it happens, we know very little about the actual numbers of carbon stocks in this system. Recently, I was part of this review uh, where we reviewed 250 papers looking at carbon storage in a number of different systems in Southeast Asia. So this is a selection of these systems. This scale is the total ecosystem carbon storage, meaning the soil carbon, the root carbon, and the above ground biomass carbon in the system. And my point with, with this figure here is to show these are the ranges uh, that we got when we combined the evidence from different studies. So basically, it's very hard to see what to do, what would happen if you move from one system to another because the ranges are so overlapping. So uncertain estimates. So we concluded that the estimates uh, of carbon stocks in these systems are highly reliable, which is uh, partly due to lack of data, 
There are very few uh, studies that actually report these time average carbon stops or carbon stops in general, and also a lack of allometric equations. Um, and when I say allometric equations, I mean equations that makes it possible to calculate the, the carbon stock in a tree based on, on the simple measurements. So equations that allow you to transfer, for example, the diameter of the tree to the biomass in a tree. So you don't have to cut down every tree that you want to know the, the carbon content of. These uh, metrics that are not, uh, commonly being applied are based on, on undisturbed forests. So big trees with a, with a, a high uh, density and not on fellow trees that are typically pioneer trees, fast growing pioneer trees and much smaller. So these equations are probably not appropriate for, um, for fellow So what we set out to do four years ago was to try to improve these carbon stock estimates for, uh, for Swedish systems. Partly by making a lot of plot based um, measurements, but also, which I will elaborate on, by developing new allometric equations specifically suited for fellows, which has not been done before, uh, for above ground and for below ground. So that's the root uh, biomass story roots. Um, and we did this by destructively sampling 150 trees in large. And I can add that we did this in areas that were going to be cleared anyway. We didn't run around uh, cutting down trees and digging them up. We selected areas that were going to be cleared. So we did this in Laos, in a little corner of the uh, Long Barn province up here. Uh, this is an area where shifting between conservation is, is uh, very widespread, but there are some ongoing changes in terms of intensification, conversion to permanent conservation of maize and rubber. And these changes are heavily supported by the government. This is actually a sign uh, announcing that the government is proud to inform us that shifting conservation has been eradicated in this particular area. Okay, so I'm now going to show some photos of, uh, of the work that we did in Laos. And while you look at these photos, you may want to think about why no one else has bothered to do this kind of work before. So this is the area. Um, these are measurements, measurements that we made in plots of uh, fellows of different agents. Oh. These are soil sampling. We, we made uh, five profiles in each of these fellows. Then we selected trees of different size classes, cut them down, and completely cut them up in small handleable pieces that we could measure and weigh and take subsample of and analyze for carbon. And using devices that we invented as we went along. And then finally, we dug up every single tree of those fellows, 150 trees, which I can reveal was quite hard labor. Okay, so what we found out was that about a quarter of the trees in these fellows that we had been investigating were resprouts. The resprout means that uh, there were trees that had been cut down maybe many times, but they were resprouting from the same root. So maybe the tree, like in this case, the tree here, this is from a five-year-old fellow, so the tree is maximum five years old. But look at this root here. There's a huge, big root uh, for this tree, a root that is slightly much older, that is definitely much older than this tree actually, maybe 50 or, or even more uh, years old. So this tree is storing more carbon uh, in the soil, in the root system, than above the, the soil. Um, so this means that we calculated a root to shoot ratio of more than 50%, so more carbon under the ground than uh, above the ground. And as a reference, IPCC, they use 0.25 uh, as their root to shoot ratio when they make carbon estimates. So again, this means that, that uh, we concluded that carbon stocks in, in a root biomass has previously been underestimated by about 30 to 40 percent because no one has accounted for these special respawning trees. So to sum up, um, the first slides they showed how there is a mitigation potential within the swimming systems. And finally, this study in Laos was just a tiny piece of the study, but this data shows that there's been a massive underestimation of the carbon storage in, uh, in fellows. 
and you can't really see above ground how much carbon is stored. And these are the colleagues that, uh, that help with the of digging of trees in our <laughs> very much. It's a good thing you have pictures up. Right. There's big evidence that you're there. <laughs> okay, now let's move to Papua New Guinea for the ecosystem services and forest management in Papua New Guinea from University of Melbourne, Dr. Rodney Keenan. Thank you. Uh, my time's up actually, so I'll sit down. So, uh, so I'm originally uh, trained in forestry. My background is in forest ecology and, and silviculture. But over the last 10 or 15 years, I've been focusing more on uh, forest policy and forest issues to do with forest management, uh, particularly policies related to climate change and ecosystem services. Uh, so I thought I'd briefly describe uh, Papua New Guinea talk about some of the issues of uh, how you implement payments for ecosystem services that might come from uh, things like red, because I, I think that links back into how changing Sweden agriculture may feed into improved livelihoods for local people. Uh, so just a bit of background on Papua New Guinea, uh, relatively misunderstood and poorly understood country uh, throughout this region. Um, has a population of just over 6 million, uh, quite a rapid population, uh, a great population increase. Uh, life expectancy isn't that great. Uh, the, the health of many people is still at high infant mortality and, um, and lack of health services. Uh, it's probably one of the most diverse countries ethnically in the world. Uh, there are over 750 language groups within that 6.3 million people, um, so uh, very diverse. Uh, many people are actually still living in and around forests, so um, those, uh, those people are highly dispersed um, through the forest landscape. It was a dependency of Australia, it gained its independence nearly 40 years ago. And uh, so most of those pe the people are, are dependent on uh, subsistence food production, based on Sweden agriculture or collection of non-timber forest products, including hunting. It's a very resource-rich country, so seen rapid development, uh, well, historically, over the last 30 years or so with mining, uh, gold mining in particular, and other minerals also important. Uh, but over the last five years or so, we've seen major investment in oil and gas, uh, which is having implications uh, for uh, local people. But forests also provide um, significant um, resources and fisheries as well. Uh, it is characterised by a high level of corruption. Um, so those uh, rents that are coming through from uh, uh, the, the royal is associated with oil, gas, uh, forests, uh, uh, minerals and forests are, are being captured largely by a relatively small uh, elite and quite an inefficient bureaucracy. Uh, so it sees area of significant forest cover, about 80% of the land is under forest uh, and uh, that's located through this uh, Cordillera area, high mountain range, um, through the centre of the country and, uh, and also um, on the islands here, New Britain, New Ireland and um, parts of Bougainville and then running down into the Solomon Islands here. So it's our nearest neighbour. Um, up in the Guinea, but as I said, relatively poorly understood by the Australian population. Uh, the forest area is a matter of some contention. Uh, I was co author on a paper a few years ago that analysed some of these, um, these different um, estimates. So, uh, back in, in the 1970s, the range of uh, estimates of forest cover varied between about uh, 29 and 33 million hectares. Uh, but the current um, figure being reported to the FAO is 33 million hectares. So um, the forest cover hasn't declined that much, um, but there's been significant uh, change in the nature of that forest cover with uh, timber harvesting and, uh, and 
another effects. We have seen some conversion to plantation agriculture, relatively limited. There's well farm plantations. There's been um, some extensive areas of fire, uh, localised mining impacts, uh, also on the forests. Uh, so this study was done, uh, I'm not a Sweden expert, my background is in cities and forestry, um, but uh, and, uh, it estimated about a third of the forest area is un under some sort of form of Sweden use. Uh, most of that is in Longfellow, greater than 15 years, um, for uh, the, that, that cutoff between uh, short and Longfellow varies, but uh, probably you could consider most of it actually is in uh, Longfellow system beyond five years, um, a relatively small amount uh, on, on shorter systems. And that, but most importantly, that area is relatively stable, so there's little conversion of primary forests going on to Sweden. And I think the other evidence is that there's some um, shift uh, from in certain parts of the landscape from these long fallow systems uh, to shorter systems. Um, but that's being accompanied by abandonment of certain uh, Sweden agriculture areas as people move in from more remote locations into um, uh, into more settled areas. Uh, so timber harvesting is a, uh, a major uh, factor in PNG. Most of the logs are exported, and uh, you can see this graph uh, from the 1990s onwards. The, the, the cut uh, was about one million uh, one million cubic meters a year. That's increased now to about 3 million cubic metres a year. And the other thing to note from this graph was that the original destination for a lot of those logs was Japan. Uh, now the major destination is China. I won't go into the reasons for that. We'll talk about it later. So that uh, logging that's occurring is quite destructive, having uh, large-scale impacts on the landscape. Uh, then it's not necessarily permanent. Uh, there is uh, regeneration occurring in some places, but it's not very, um, uh, it's only sporadic and, and kind of ad, ad hoc unplanned um, regeneration, not a managed system. There are some um, types of operations that are relatively low impact uh, using reduced impact logging principles, but uh, relatively small parts of the, of the forest uh, management system are managed that way. And we're also seeing expansion of small-scale timber harvesting uh, by local communities for, uh, for local purposes and a bit of sale of timber into local markets in some instances. So about five or six years ago, uh, I led a group that did an estimate of CO2 emissions from selective harvesting. So you can see there there's um, uh, about uh, yeah, the emissions were about 60 million tonnes a year from um, of CO2 being emitted from selective harvesting timber operations. So the question is what direction that might take in the future. Is it going to increase? Is it going to be stable? Or uh, can uh, red, a driver like red, uh, lead to a reduction in, uh, in emissions from timber harvesting? Uh, so that's certainly the hope of the government under their climate compatible development policy uh, they've estimated that 95% of their emissions derive from um, what we call Lulu CF, um, and, and in this case, it's selection uh, harvesting of, of timber, um, and then the shift to sustainable forestry uh, can potentially uh, use international carbon credits to raise the income and promote the development of local people. So, is that really possible? Uh, as part of some work that's been done under an ACR project uh, in Lala um, that I think is relevant here, they identified some conditions for payments for ecosystem services, that uh, there are clear and transparent property rights for the services that are being delivered, um, so that they can be sold, uh, that there's trust between the parties that are buying and those who are selling the service, uh, pretty much like any market. The transaction costs associated with the, uh, the sale are relatively low, uh, so negotiating and, uh, and complying with the, the contracts, uh, those transaction costs are a small part. Uh, that we can actually measure effectively the outputs, and until we've uh, gone into that for carbon, the efforts that are required there, but 
uh, for issues such as watershed services is required to actually measure the benefits of reduced soil erosion, increased water quality that uh, might come from changing forest management practices. Uh, and that there are simple and effective payment options and that there are a range of fiscal equitable sharing of the benefits of those payments uh, within the community. So part of this requires carbon accounting. Um, so there are various uh, balances that you need to take into account there. Um, timber harvesting by increasing forest residues enhances the, the respiration or uh, emission of CO2. Uh, regrowth and increasing regrowth can actually uh, take the carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in forests. Uh, increased uh, combustion, use of fuel in timber harvesting or burning up the harvesting may increase emissions. And then you can get some benefits of long-term storage of carbon uh, in wood products that are removed from the forest. So all of these things need to be taken into account in, in uh, undertaking accounting of carbon in all of these places. So I cut some of the key uncertainties in uh, the case of Papua New Guinea. Uh, those rates of forest cover change, what's actually going on in the forest. Uh, what are the estimates of intact forest carbon stocks? Uh, how much forest has been converted to other uses after harvesting? Uh, often what happens when timber harvesting occurs is that uh, the communities will come on to that land after it's been harvested and used uh, for gardens. Um, and also for other uh, factors such as the extent of intensification of swing, what the rate of recovery is after after the abandonment of the Sweden area and uh, potential impacts of fire and future climate change. So there's a, a potential pool of dollars there that can be used to drive change in, in behaviour in forest management. Uh, that might be coming from governments, might come from, from entities that need to offset their emissions, power companies, oil companies, uh, coal miners, airlines or individual citizens who want to voluntarily pay to offset their personal carbon emissions. Then you have a group of people who might, in you know, a developing country, who are eyeing off the, that pool of funds for a whole range of national development purposes. So the point I wanted to make here that landowners um, and you know, Sweden type system are actually just one, one uh, small group within that, uh, uh, you know, that large group, probably one of the least powerful groups that might be eyeing off these dollars. And, the, the arrangements seem to be based on some sort of performance-based contract. So what are the options for PNG? Um, they can reduce their harvest rates to a more long-term sustainable supply and, re, uh, and use uh, reduced impact logging systems more broadly. Uh, they can diversify the industry and local processing. Uh, they, can, uh, they can reduce the intensification of Sweden, rehabilitate degraded areas, they need to uh, improve the quantification of, of emissions. Uh, and they could potentially use their rent payments to benefit long-term forest owners. But can they actually achieve that uh, in practice? Do they satisfy those conditions? Uh, my assessment, um, based on what I know about the country, is uh, they're a long way from being able to do that. And we can discuss the reasons for that in the question time. Thanks. Thank you, sir. We have two questions in mind. What is good and bad about shifting cultivation? And is it here to stay in the Philippine landscape? I, I still remember them, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so we have our five scholars here who brought us all around the Swedenic world. We have Dr. Wolfram Dressler, who took us to Tagbanua of Palawan. And uh, Global Overview Changes in Sweden by Ole Mertz. Dr. Rob Kram in Sarawak, Malaysia, 29 years. I like that. But it's not there anymore, right? And then the Sweden and Red Plus. We have good pictures of these big roots underground. And ecosystem services in Papua New Guinea. So who's going to give us the first question? 
or a first answer to the questions. Yes, sir. Please introduce yourself. Limit your question to one, only one. And I'm giving you five seconds. No. Instead of five seconds, no. could you give me five minutes? No, sir. Three minutes. I'm a forester. Okay, three minutes. <laughs> yes, sir. Keep up. I'm a forester, and I served in the Bureau of Forestry for several years, and in the logging industry for several years, and taught in forestry schools uh, in uh, Agusan Sur, in Los Banos, and in Caruban City. Uh, for several years. Now I'm retired and I would like to uh, give some of my experiences while I was there and here. Uh, I agree with uh, the data of this uh, uh, co, uh, co, uh, co uh, scientist of mine and uh, we thank you for sharing with us your experiences, your knowledge in this uh, and in making, because this is a problem in the Philippines. When I was in the Bureau of Forestry, we could not do anything when I was assigned in Basila. In fact, we lost two laborers. They killed. They were killed by the Kaineros. And uh, so, instead of uh, implementing the 1903, well, we employed some of them in reforestation, in nursery, and things like this. When I was in a city plumber company as a research forester for uh, 11 years, uh, what we did was we encouraged the Caimineros to uh, vacate their Caimines, and when they are ready, we even give them free seedlings, and we hired them to plant the seedlings. And then later on, we hired the father as our laborers, and we established a school for Polish workers financed by the company for the children of these Cayeneros so that when they uh, graduate after one year, they can be employed in the company. And since only the small kids and the mother are left, sometimes now they uh, vacate their Cayenes and uh, established houses in the logging camps. And when I was with the uh, big corps in Nakusan Sur and Sumigao Sur, what we did was we encouraged the Kainiros to vacate their uh, Kainings everywhere, but establish, give them Kainings along the rivers. Because uh, they, we give them farms there so that they can uh, raise uh, corn and bananas and then. We compartmentalize the creeks and the rivers so that they have these parts. And the company buy the, the products of the companies. Okay. And the from the... So... Salamat po. So, uh, this is a Thank very you. different perspective. Yeah. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you also. It is a very different perspective from what we have. Okay, this is uh, a government employee with the who says, first thing he said, is bad. Okay, so let's have that in, in mind. I also take note that Dr. Dr. Mauricio had the pink post in there that says no. Okay, you have a good answer there. Uh, would any one of you uh, make a short comment? Five scholars against one government employee here. Okay, okay, we'll go on. Yes, Mrs. Baldon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Maria Dias Baldon. I work for World Fish, but I did my master's thesis in um, nomadic charcoal production. So, uh, when you, um, I'm very, very, I was very interested with the diet of um, Malaysia. That was really very interesting for me because I'm a person, I'm an economics person. So my question would be is, you talk about traditional uh, shifting cultivation or traditional Sweden cultivation, which is tied up with the culture of the people. Have you considered 
um, that perhaps the loss of identity of the ethnic people and the disintegration and decentralization of individualist um, individual people as as a as a, as a single person rather than as a group be a driver for uh, for for student agriculture to increase rather than an impact in itself. Because from our perspective, we have we have several um, ethnic groups in the Philippines that do Sweden agriculture. We have the IES and you have the ones from Palawan. Um, then you have the nomadic um, Sweden, um, Kainiers, we call them. And these have no specific tribal ties whatsoever. They are driven simply to produce charcoal. So would you, do you think this is a relevant uh, thing to consider for future research? These are the partial, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. That's very interesting. Uh, I think that category of Sweden culture by the, we, we don't observe in Sarawak. It's much more as uh, Wolfram described it as a, an integral system. Uh, so those communities have been established in those territories for several centuries, the Bakalintan community since about the 16th century. Uh, so cultivating those forests on a cyclical basis in an integral way for some time. Uh, and as, as your question says, their identity is very much tied up with their occupation of that territory. And, uh, and every square meter of that territory which they've known through farming, through uh, hunting, through gathering forest products, uh, and so on, is, is their attachment to that place, if you like, is crucial to their identity. So they themselves would say they're faced with a dilemma. The decline of, or the disappearance of human cultivation is really an economic issue for them. Uh, it's, they don't have the labor, the time uh, to invest in it anymore. But the interesting thing is they don't want to abandon that land or the longhouse, uh, even if they're not there most of the year. Uh, they will invest, I didn't show pictures of their new longhouse, you would be happy to live there. It's like a double story brick and concrete structure with color bond roof. And, and, but it's those working in the cities who are sending back the money to employ laborers to build this magnificent new longhouse, and they say, why, why are we doing this? We probably, probably won't be anyone here in, in five or ten years' time. So they are conflicted themselves. To be, to be a new barn, to be a diag, is to belong to a, a room in a longhouse. Culturally, that's, it's very hard to see. Like once you're just, as you say, an individual in a city without a connection to a longhouse, so, you start to lose your identity, at least that's the fear. So they, they want to keep their, their ritual connection with the longhouse and they want to keep their, their rights to the land and forest, however it's used. And those who settled in the city and their children are born in the city and being educated and seeking employment in the city and even in other countries, they still want their children to inherit the, the land and forest that they left behind even if those children can't remember anymore or have no experience of how to find their land amongst all that secondary forest. So a bit different from your, your charcoal gatherers. I don't see that happening in, in Malaysia, but this strong attachment to, to the longhouse and the land uh, is, is a very striking feature of the transition that those people are going through. Thank you, sir. Are you happy with the answer? Okay, great. Any other questions? Comments? Please introduce yourself. Good afternoon. I am Rinaldo Olvida of the Philippine Rice Research Institute, and I'm currently leading the Upland Rice Development Program in Region 4. Um, for Dr. Dressler, hi. hi. Well, <laughs> because, um, well, we were such a fan because we've been reading your, we've been reading your literature for so long and this is, this is the first time that we met you. Um, first, um, the answer, to answer your, the first question, what's good 
and about and back about shifting agriculture, uh, shifting cultivation. Um, in our case, um, in the Philippine rice production, um, shifting cultivation um, helps preserve culture and tradition, especially for affluent uh, indig indigenous communities. That's the first answer that I mean, just to share. Um, because um, now, uh, at present, the Philippines still has a very rich traditional varieties of rice because of this um, shifting cultivation that is that is being practiced by our upland farmers, upland rice farmers. And the second question is, will it be a part of my landscape? Well, um, as lead, leading the upland rice development program, it definitely is a part of my landscape. Um, and I am seeing a different perspective um, because prior to implementing the program, I had a very negative uh, negative perception of shifting um, cultivation. However, when I get to work with the upland farmers, then it is the only time that I understood um, why they are doing upland cultivation. And um, it, because um, for upland farmers, um, their identity is being defined by the kind of rice variety that they are planting. I'm so sorry if, if I concentrate on rice because it is my <laughs> my bias, but that's that's what I can share here. Um, the farmers are being identified through the rice variety. Uh, if they are in the higher, um, what, what do you call that? Higher position in the community, it is because of the kind of varieties that they, uh, rice varieties that they plant. If they are sikat or if they are popular, it is because of the kind of rice varieties they are planting. Um, we've been working with the Tagbanwas of Apalawan, Aperlan Palawan. Um, I've met the I Atis uh, Atis of Poblon and we're working with the uh, uh, Mangyans of Mindon. Good afternoon. So, so I'm not allowed to, to present them here, but we are. Um, yeah, we, I think we are submitting the paper in a, in a month maybe, so hopefully it will come out later this year. Ryan McNichol from University of Edinburgh is the main brain behind the elementary. We are not allowed to present, but she can discuss with you, of course. <laughs> Uh, many uh, different species, and they tend to have a different amount of biomass carbon back in the plants. Yeah, it, it's not species specific. There are so many different species in, in these fellows, so unfortunately, that that's not that was not possible. Um, but we we have element traits specifically for the for the respawning trees, and then for the for the normal non respawning trees. So we have two element traits. Good question. I suggest you talk to her break time. That's we have to grab the scholars, you know, we have to get the opportunity to talk to them. Okay, another question please. Yes. Hi, I'm Tanya from the Exchange Program. We have a lot of 
opinion relate that question? <clears throat> um, I was recently in Brooks Point, this is for Dr. Resner, and even the indigenous peoples there are already saying <clears throat> um, there are too many of them to be sustaining the way that they used to do Pioneer. So uh, my question is, do you have a like a guideline for how much is still acceptable for a total land area? Too many the population is there's still yeah, many for the people. people. So this is traditional. Traditional is Thanks for the question. Um, I know some of your colleagues at TFP uh, Exchange, and I think you do uh, wonderful work. Um, and I think NGOs on Palawan do fantastic work. And I think the, en the answer, um, there's no easy answer to that question. Um, I think population dynamics, um, whether perceived and understood by Katatubo, or by outsiders, is, is it's a complex, kind of fluid situation. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to give a prescription um, to the, 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 the UMA situation, you know, the population density and, and UMA um, situation. I think the, the best possible um, kind of applied um, intervention is one that is developed by the indigenous community, uh, civil society, NGOs, and perhaps the DNR. Um, and it's, it's one that uh, works within the context of sustaining and managing uh, and enhancing Sweden fallows. Yeah? So finding ways to work with local uh, knowledge, management systems to enhance uh, the fallow period, uh, to make the fallow productive. Yeah, so David Wilson uh, with Rodal Lasco, I think Kraft, yeah, they've, they've been looking at this for a long time. Um, but I think the answers come from within the community uh, in, in, in uh, collaboration with, with active uh, civil society that has worked in, in, a location, in, the, in a particular location for a long period of time. So it's, it's kind of supplementing and enhancing what already works rather than finding kind of an external intervention um, that often has a lot of negative unintended consequences. So that's, there's no simple answer, but I think that's the best, most culturally appropriate uh, way to go. So thanks. Thank you. Dr. Marta. I am in America, I may return to the uh, I like to follow up on the pop, uh, population density the program that's uh, presented his data. He has uh, presented his population density is too low. Because uh, what is good in balance is the population. Because uh, Kaengin is one of the ready uh, form of livelihood employment. Even if it is not acceptable or is illegal, then people will be doing. So that means also that maybe the form of government is also a factor in determining why Kaimin is, uh, is uh, growing. So what is the population density of Bala? Uh, yeah, I don't know the latest figures. <laughs> Fortunately, but it's uh, it's relatively low, uh, particularly in Brooks um, and in southern Palawan. But um, indeed, I mean population management, health, um, empowerment. You know, these are all important factors to consider when managing uh, Sweden systems and follow with local people. But again, it has to be uh, you know reproductive health, um, family planning, and how that connects with Sweden. It all has to done in a locally uh, appropriate way, you know. So it's, particularly with Katutubo, indigenous people, is, it's, a, it's a very complicated um, and often, uh, yeah, delicate situation. Yeah. So it's, it's, 
It needs to be handled with care. Yeah. I have a question. In the definition of Crown by Paul 209, it says, yeah, I'm happy it's here. It says it was an intermittent clearing, etc., etc., and did not mention anything about fire. Was this intentional? Because in old school, the definition of Sweden agriculture or slash and burn always has the clearing, burning, and follow. And that's why it has a negative already at first glance. But your definition definitely did not say anything about burning. Why? I think it was an oversight. Oversight? <laughs> oversight? Uh, almost always it involves a burning as a, a labor efficient way of clearing and converting the biomass into ash fertilizer and also ameliorating the soil conditions to make a single crop of rice uh, possible. So certainly all the systems in Sarawak that I'm familiar with and others in other parts of Southeast Asia in, involve uh, burning. when we talk about Sweden, it's sort of built into the word. Sweden is derived from those uh, Scandinavian word meaning burn field. Uh, but there are systems that uh, actually do not use burning in the Pacific, in South America, in Central Africa, where it's more a slash and loss system, but they're quite rare, and where it's very human. And they don't use the word Sweden. Yeah. No, most Swindlers don't use the word Sweden. <laughs> so yes. They have all types of other terms for it, but uh, it's something we have decided to call it. Actually, that was the first lesson in Antro. First lesson of the day was the difference between Kainin, Nero, and Kainero. Who are students here? Kainero is one who makes Kain baskets, <laughs> and Kaininero is the one that makes the Kain. That was the lesson number day one of my Sweden agriculture with the late Domin Ramirez. I, I'm a Sweden student also. I was a Sweden student. So Kainen, I, I saw that in some of the videos. Kainero and Kainenero. Lesson for the day. OK, do we have any questions? More questions? Yes, sir. Comment. Yeah, can I just put a little twist on the first question uh, by saying that I don't think there is anything good or bad about shipping cultivation or sweeping cultivation, whatever we call it. Um, I think it's a system that people use because it's the best possible opportunity for them to have a production in the given circumstances. Um, they will change it, like in Rob's case in Sarawak, if it no longer fits them. Um, but it functions wherever people are using it. I, I don't have any, uh, if some of you can give me a case of where Sweden cultivation systems have broken down, that has often been said that they will break down eventually with population pressure. So I would like for you to give it to me. Because I don't think they, they exist. What happens is that long before you come close to a breaking down point, people have changed to something else. They do something else and they find other ways. Uh, so in that way, it functions. You can say it has some impacts of different types that are not very well understood. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's... Uh, my point on that quest question is that it's not really a fair question. No. Do, do we ask uh, for categorized cultivation? What is good and bad about it? Well, we can do something. Tend to ask the question more to switch to switch I don't know what you think about that. 